Hello, thank you uh, to the National Foreign Language Center for inviting me to share my presentation on stations in the middle school classroom at Yale in their Apart But Together Expanding Our Community uh, Summit. So my name's Trudy Anderson, and I'm from the New Haven Public Schools in New Haven, Connecticut. And this presentation was done for CT Cold and also for NET12 uh, this, uh, this spring. Um, many people think that stations are only for younger children and I would contend that doing stations can work all the way through high school. And in this session, we're gonna talk about how that is, but first one of our outcomes is going to be how we choose materials and how we assess materials for stations and the logistics for setting up stations. In addition, at the end, I will give some thoughts on what we could do if we decided to do this online because coming up in the next school year, no one's quite yet sure about what format their school uh, districts will take. So I'll give you some ideas on how this could possibly be done for online work. So why do stations? So I think that stations are wonderful because they're multimodal ways for working with students. Students can be independent, I can work with smaller groups, whether it's for taught speaking practice or things that they don't really know very well that I could work with them. They're great for reviewing and for expanding on material that already taught or was already taught. You can introduce new material and just to see if they could figure something out. And my students really like them because it's a break from the normal routine. Now, our supervisor, Jessica Haxey, and she challenged us as teachers to make magic with our lesson planning. And I just thought stations just fits perfectly into the whole magic theory, that there's movement because students get to move around the room. And I teach middle school and my students really, we have very long periods. Our periods are 80 minutes long. They need to move. So they get to move around the room. I'm using authentic resources as much as possible while I'm doing stations. They get to play games, they get to interact with each other. I give things that might be challenging for them so that they could try to figure it out. So I think the whole idea of magic is clearly indicated when you do something like stations with your students. So how do I set up my stations? Now I look around my room and I decide where in the room I'd like to put things. Every station is clearly labeled with directions. And I choose to, since I teach middle school, I walk around to each station with the students and explain what needs to be done and their examples there. I make sure that I have copies for all the students, that they have their headphones, the timer, Anything that they could possibly need is there. And I place all my links on Google Classroom so kids can just click on, stay in Google Classroom, click on the activities, fill out everything right there in Google Classroom. And I choose to group my students ahead of time, especially for the classes that are really large. I group them, I set the timer for them to move from one station to the other, and I assign each group at a start station. I try not to have the groups be too large by making sure I have enough stations for the students to get through. And if more than likely some kids might finish earlier than others, so I try to leave one station open for those students to go there and work independently. And I also explain to them how we're gonna end the class, how we're gonna wrap up the station, what they'll turn into Google Classroom, how they're gonna clean up the room. Now, there's a lot of leeway in deciding what kind of stations you'd like to have. So you could do the basic things like listening and reading and speaking and writing. That's up to you. I like it also for speaking because students can work on dialogues together. We need to assess students' proficiency levels so I can do my teacher interviews with the students then to check their, their proficiency levels. 
You could do something old, it's great for review, and something new, just previewing what might be coming up in their new lessons. You could do the three modes of communication if you chose to. You could do crafts, you could work on pictures. If it's a holidays are coming up, you could do something about the holidays. And there uh, should be opportunities that they could also play games that have something to do with the unit that you're working on. Now, to me, the fun part is choosing the materials. Now, I'm going to admit that choosing and finding and choosing materials will take some work at the very beginning. But you can compile all the things that you've done over, the, over a period of time and build a portfolio in order to have things ready for your stations. So I look, I look in Pinterest quite often for things that I could use for the units that I'm doing. You could do teachers pay teachers materials. YouTube is great for all their videos, as you know. You could use a newspaper. If you live close to an area where there, you can find those newspapers in Spanish or whatever language you, you're choosing, then it's a great resource to have flyers, uh, yellow pages, wealth of information, infographics are great. You could create your own materials. You could use, my textbook has a website that you could go for games and review. You could choose that. Uh, you should also think about other classes that you could find information for math and social studies and art and music that you could also use in your classes. You could use pictures. You could use the websites like Zachary Jones. So there's a wealth of places that you could find information and resources that you could use for your stations. Now, I think one of the harder things for me is that after I found all those resources, well, what on earth am I gonna do with them? Because I think a lot of times we are very likely to want to ask the same kinds of questions that you mean idea or fact detail questions. So my suggestion is to first think about what we want them to do in the task that you're giving them. And then ask yourself, depending on what level your students are in, whether you're going to ask your questions in English or in your target language. Now, since I teach middle school and I'm the first exposure many of my students have to the language, most of the time my questions will be in English. So the resource will be in Spanish, but my questions are in English. As they get a little bit more proficient, I might put in one or two questions for them in Spanish. And so you'll see right here that I linked a question types handout, and here is this is one of the things I do use to help me when I'm making up questions for my resources because it not only includes main idea, fact, detail, but it has grammar type questions, it has inference, things like that, that kind of pushes the, in the proficiency of my students. So I'd encourage you to take a quick look at that because that's a really good resource to help you to make your task for your students. Now, in this next section, I'm going to be talking to you about some of the things that I use in my, my classes and what I do with them. Now, these aren't the only things you could do with them. These are just suggestions of what I've done. So here's this picture. Um, and here, I'd say if your kids are novice low, more than likely they'll only recognize the colors and how many people are there and they might be able to say the weather. But as your students become more and more proficient, they can do more things. So for example, in this one, this comes, I use this during a unit when kids are learning how to ask questions. And so I give them the challenge. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna look at this picture and write as many questions as you can come up with. And it doesn't matter if it's a ridiculous question, like why is the sky blue? It really doesn't matter. Come up with as many questions as you can. And the wonderful thing about stations is that you can always do extension activities. So during the stations, the kids make their questions and then turn them in today. An extension activity for this could be something as simple as what I do with them is play a boggle style activity. So what the students do is they say what their question is. 
If somebody else has exactly the same question, they cross it out. And then we're trying to see who has at least one question left at the end of the, the round. And that person will get a little prize because they had a question left over at the end. So that's one option. In addition, I won't be playing these videos for you, but I'll explain what is there. The first two, the Arrocha and the Kmart videos. So these I use with my novice law students when they're doing the school unit and when they're doing a clothing unit. And the Arrocha video, the, it's a pharmacy and they are advertising for back to school. And so what I do is I ask the, I give the students a little sheet with a word bank of all the things that, the words that they've learned so far for school items. And they watch the video several times and they circle the items that they see or hear from the video. And then there might be a little question about what they would buy in order to go back to school. The Kmart video is very similar with a word bank because these are not as low students. And they would also write what items they would buy in order to go back to school. The next video, which is a Procter & Gamble video, which happens to be one of my favorite videos, it makes me teary every time I watch it. Procter & Gamble does a video, a commercial during the Olympics, every time there's an Olympic and it's a, a video that are, are an advertisement that thanks the moms for all the work that they do to get their their athletes to the Olympics. In this one, the moms are from all over the world and they are doing chores in their homes. I asked the students to write down the chores that they see the moms do while they're watching this video. So they do that during sessions. And then I have an extension activity that we do afterwards because then we talk about, well, these are the chores that you saw the moms do. Do you think your moms do those chores? Are there others that your moms do or they don't do? Well, what are the chores that the dads do? What are the chores that the daughters do and the chores that the sons do? And then they make a comparison. And sometimes we get to talk about gender roles and doing chores in the home. So you can always do extensions with some of the things that you ask the kids to start with in class. And the last video is a SpongeBob one. And um, in, this, in this video, SpongeBob is singing about why he loves Mondays and he's getting ready for the day. And we, I use this one while we're doing reflexive verbs. And so the kids get to tell what SpongeBob does to get ready on a Monday morning to face his day. And then an extension activity is they could also write about or speak about what they do in order to get ready on a Monday or any day for that matter. Now, infographics, I like to use them a lot. The important thing is to find infographics about things that they are interested in or that's closely related to the unit that you're working on. So at this stage, my students like to use Snapchat, they like to use Instagram, for example. So I found this um, infographic on Snapchat and then made questions that went along with that. And you can find infographics by Googling Spanish infographics on and you put whatever title it is or whatever language it is that you want. It's quite easy to find infographics that are very applicable to what the students are doing. Now, as I said before, it's, an, it's, it's really a good idea to look at what other people are doing in your school so that you can do that too. So this graphic, came from kindergarten. I saw it lying on the copier because somebody left it there and I thought, wow, it's right around Christmas. My students are just starting to learn how to describe people. This would be perfect to use. And so in this one, the, the students wrote in words that would describe Mr. Grinch. And then since they're not as low, they wrote very simple sentences describing uh, what Mr. Grinch looks like and what he is like. For writing, sure, they can write paragraphs, but for example, I think my students being in middle school and being obsessed with their phones, they actually do like writing on this graphic. Now you could print it if you want to, but you can go to a website called ifaketext.com and then they could text each other on the phones 
and they have Androids and, and, and iPhones templates, and they could text each other. So for example, one of the things I've done is invite your friend to go do something on the weekend, and then they just texted, wrote their conversation in the iFake text, and then that what gets turned into me, shared with me, and that's a writing assignment. It doesn't have to be a paragraph. It could be in different forms. Also, I, as part of the magic, you can do games with them. You can use dice for verb conjugation or numbers, coloring pages with numbers and conjugations. I know there's some uh, websites that you could get pictures from where you conjugate a verb and color it and it's all the spanish masters if you uh painters if if you're interested you could have songs where they're filling in the blanks you could do crafts while you're with them so here's an example of a song and in this song again i'm not playing these but it's called a mi me gustan las hamburguesas and it's a really fun song that I, I admit will get caught in your head. And here the person is singing about the, that he or she loves hamburgers and all the things the person absolutely does not like to, to eat. And so in this one, it's possible, with, as with some songs, that you give them a word bank, you give them a copy of the song with words missing, and the students have to listen to the song and fill in the word, uh, the blanks with the words from the word bank. An extension activity for this that I've done with my students is I've given, and it's, I like to sing, so I sing the song for them, uh, the, rewrite the chorus, and I'll sing about the things that I like to eat and what I don't like to eat, and then challenge the students to say, okay, you go ahead and write about what you like and what you don't like. And for a little prize or you know an incentive, how about you sing it for the class? And you'd be shocked how many students choose to sing in front of the class or something like this. As I mentioned before, the yellow pages are great. I found this one for a few years ago about a supermarket and so many questions, so many cognates that it was just right in the spot where my students are close to novice low, novice mid, that they were able to read this. And I think it's great because the students feel good about themselves that they're using a real life resource that they could have looked at this and figured out what they needed to do or what they could buy in the supermarket. Now let's consider what we could do with stations if we chose to do them online. Since we're not sure in my district what we'll be doing yet, or we haven't been told yet well, how our school would be in the fall, it's possible that some of our classes might be online and some in class. If I were to choose, I would always keep my stations in class because I think the interaction that the students have is just really wonderful and choose to do other things online. However, if you choose to do us uh, uh, stations online, here are some thoughts about what you could do. One thing to start off with is to be sure of access that all your students have some sort of computer or Chromebook and Wi-Fi that they'll be able to complete the work. I think it's important to review school uh, protocols for online learning and let the students know where to turn in their completed work. My, for my go-to for a lot of my things is on Google Classroom, but they could share things with you on Google Drive or however you choose. And how I would set this up is I would do a Google Slides for my students. I'd email it, the information to my students where all the links are there and the slides are there explaining what they'll be doing. I would make sure that I'm giving clear instructions of what they need to do and support that they'll need. So for I'd give them examples so they know what it should look like. I would give them sentence starters so they would know how to go about doing their work, especially for kids who are not as low. I would limit the amount of technologies and things that I'm asking them to do. So I would do fewer activities and also making sure that I'm concentrating on the content and not all the dazzle off technology. And when kids are working online, there's always the issue of the translators. And be clear on what your policies are. 
So my students understand that since I'm not a heritage language speaker, I absolutely don't know every single word and there are times I'm going to have to look things up. And so I think teaching students how to use dictionaries are important, but explaining to them that it's okay to look up a word, but it's not okay to look up entire sentence structures because what you're really looking for is their proficiency, not somebody else's. I would suggest that you meet as a whole group at the beginning and also the end of the session for debriefing and maybe consider some non-screen activity. So, you know, there could be a little video about exercising or stretching before they move on to the next activity. And one thing I'd suggest, since they're all the meeting links for each, each group to visit each online group, just pop in, just like you would walk around in class, pop into each group to make sure that they're staying on task. So for example, I have it here that I would put in the groups. So give each group and list the students and the link where they're going to meet for their breakout room. And then you could assign whatever activities that you would like them to do. And so, for example, here again, I'd say all the groups will meet at the main page for their directions. That's where I give directions, give the tasks of what they need to do, or explain the tasks because they'll already have it. And then give them their activities, the time that they would do the activities for, and the links for that. And then say at the end of it all, we all meet back at the main page for debriefing and would do that again for all the other groups that you decided to, to have. Now accountability is important I think because students always feel like if they're going to do something they want to get a grade for it or it's, it, they always ask is this going to count and you're going to say of course it's going to count. So the first thing you'd be explaining to them is why are we doing these stations in the first place? Is it for review? Is it to challenge you to work on something else? And they should expect that some of the work will be graded. I absolutely will not grade every single assignment. I'm going to choose which ones I'm going to uh, grade. And I will never tell them ahead of time which ones it will be because I really do want them to pay attention to what they're working on. I suggest that you monitor their work all the time. So I, even if I'm one of the stations where students are coming to, uh, for interviews or extra help, I will, if, you know, periodically get up and walk around the room and see what the students are doing. So make sure that you just take a look because sometimes they might need a little help or a little nudge to get back to the work of what they're doing. And depending on what you see as you walk around the room, or as you correct the student's work, you'll realize that maybe you need to reteach something or maybe they came up with something interesting and then we could do the whole activity as a whole class. Those are the extensions that I mentioned before. So for example, the one where I said they did the information about what the moms did. Well, the whole class will now talk about what other members of the family might do in class. So it can always extend it to a whole class activity depending on what you say. Well, on this slide, I put in this um, link here is I, since I teach Spanish, I did, I, I curated a bunch of resources based on Spanish one and based on the units that we teach in Spanish one. So if you click on that, there's a whole bunch of activities that you could start off with to have stations in your own classroom. And you can always add them or change them to match what your units are in your school. And if you have any questions or comments for me, here is my contact information. There are two different emails there for me that if you'd like to, to ask a question or make a comment. Thank you for spending the time to listen and watch my presentation. And again, thank you to the National Foreign Language Center for inviting me to be a part of this virtual summit. And I hope you have a great summer and a really good school year coming up. Thank you.